I'm very happy to introduce you uh, Dr. Jean de la Rosette because he don't need any introduction. So I'm very glad about it. Uh, everybody knows him. So, Doctor, when you want. Thank you, I think every, thank you for the very kind invitation. I'm happy to be here. I learn a lot from, uh, from this meeting, honestly. I, um, my main activity is actually in the urology, um, but I also uh, are involved in our prostate clinic. I have every Tuesday a whole day seeing patients who have prostate carcinoma, discuss with those patients the different options. I, I listen very carefully what I should offer to my patients for active surveillance. Um, every time I leave a meeting like this here, I'm very enthusiastic and I think I should do everything that is being discussed here. I, um, I uh, love to offer them MRIs. I love to offer them any possible treatment. And, and one of these is focal therapy. I listened very carefully to, uh, to Carlos, who said focal therapy is not in the guidelines. And I asked myself, how is it possible that active surveillance actually with limited data moved into the guidelines and focal therapy did not? How is it that we have no evidence actually, strong evidence on MRI, but it's in guidelines? That's amazing. So it doesn't mean that focal therapy doesn't deserve a place, but we should critically evaluate. And when I, got, when I finished my training in uh, 1992, I was lucky to be involved in uh, studying high-intensity focus ultrasound. The problem at the time was that the companies just wanted to sell their technology as quick as possible. And it took that company about 30 years, 30 years, to have it finally FDA approved. And they did something completely wrong. They just build a machine, you stick something in a patient, and you just say, you claim it works. And obviously, I think we as urologists want to believe that everything that is offered to us, a new box with wonderful screens, with wonderful tools, it works. Now, I'm going to share with you the presentation that was uh, given at the occasion of the ICUD meeting, which was on ablative treatments um, hosted at the occasion of the SIU in Melbourne last year, of which uh, Rafal was the uh, chairperson of that, uh, of that group. And at that occasion, I was asked to cover the technologies that are at the moment available and not come with any strong conclusion whether you should use it, yes or not. If you look at the different technologies, most of them are energy-based. You can offer heat or cold to patients. They also can be non-thermal. Maybe some of you have heard about histotripsy, where animal studies and the first in human studies are being done. You've got chemical approaches. And of course, also the radio oncologists are very strongly coming in offering focal treatments. So as much as you may be confused about all the different diagnostics you should do to patients, I'm also very confused which one I maybe should offer to my patients or should include in my clinic. The lucky part for me is that I'm working in an academic hospital and I can do some of the research. And companies are coming to me and offering me all these different boxes. And one is maybe better than the other. But the first issue here is, can we properly study one of your boxes? And I will present later some of the research we are doing there. That's with a nano knife. Question is, should I immediately obtain it and use it? I think you should be involved in knowing what the data are. Let's look at the different energy sources and what is the evidence available on focal treatment. Focal, which means a non-whole gland treatment. Actually, only treat the tumor. Well, I'm not going into discussion significant or not significant tumor, but just treat the tumor where it has been identified. If you see that Einstein actually was the first to come with this idea a century ago, the first applications were in 1971 for medical use, and it was for skin treatment. 
you can you are know, know that we have different lasers available. Uh, we're using them often for all kind of different treatments for BPH or for stone treatment. And all of them are based on a certain physical background. And this background helps us in case of prostate abnormalities to offer these uh, heat therapies actually, in this case, based on whether you use a continuous wave, which is in the first cartoon, long pulse or short pulse duration. And you can cause more or less vascular and eventually cellular damage. Some of the uh, studies that have been facing the surface are limited in numbers. Um, uh, from Princess Margaret, some of the research has been coming. And if you look at that, um, MRI is being used or just via the transperineal route. You have some advantages and disadvantages. And obviously with the laser you can come up with very discrete and complete ablation as has been confirmed. But the disadvantages is often that these lesions are rather small. If you use MRI, it's a cumbersome procedure and it can be very costly. If you look at the oncological data, you can see that the number of patients which are documented for focal treatment, again, are small. Toronto, 12 patients, and depending on the criteria where you say there is a response, yes or not, it seems to be almost in two-thirds of patients. Chicago, you can see nine patients were treated for focal treatment. You can see the response rate was 78%. And when you move to New York, in more cases, it's 96%. <clears throat> Honestly speaking, it's, I think, a very interesting option, but it's very early at this moment to come up with some strong statements that laser would be a good option solely as, as a treatment. So it's under investigation. Cryoablation, we will hear later more about it, but for the focal approach, again, Limited data are available. Looking at cold as application for treatment, it's already known for centuries, but actually the first treatments were close to 1966. You can see that we were not that sophisticated yet. We had either the transurethral or even an open approach. The um, background behind this is obvious that freezing kills cells and you combine often a freezing and a thawing cycle to have the optimal result, as illustrated in this cartoon. You can have direct <coughs> cell death, but you can also have a little bit delayed cell death caused by the vascular damage which is caused. Again, patient selection is crucial here. As you know, cryosurgery, again, got FDA approval. Um, the whole debate is which are now the best candidates if you consider a focal treatment. Obviously, unifocal cancers would be the ideal candidates for that. If you look at multifocal disease, obviously it makes sense, it's less suitable. Looking at the uh, equipment that you use, those who use brachytherapy are familiar with it, and this, via the transperineal route, is in most of these ablative treatments, the used approach. You can see here that if you want to go for a focal treatment, you can use, again, ultrasound. You have real-time imaging. You can see the ice ball being formed. Um, you, you can create larger areas. Disadvantages, as with anything, you have to balance whether the <coughs> collateral damage is acceptable because most patients who want to move for a focal treatment want to maintain their quality of life, and you would not like to have a damage of the neurovascular bundle. Then you have the heat sink effect, where you cannot always guarantee that all the area where you uh, try to um, uh, treat is actually properly treated and there is no remnant tumor. But which patients would be good candidates for that? Well. According to the users in cryoablation, and again, I'm not an expert in this, but the literature says there is an increased interest that's coming from the cold registry, and especially the focus there is on patients who are radiation failures, 
or patients who uh, are ineligible for radical prostatectomy. So again, a certain group that is selected for this according to what the literature says. If you go for photodynamic therapy, again, this is a completely different approach. You can see that, again, it's being introduced in prostates in 1996, so that's quite recently. And you can see that when you use this technology, you might have some severe side effects when you expose patients early to sunlight. I think from the background, again, you can see that there is a combination of a photosensitizer and an optical laser fiber, and in this combination, you get eventually cell destruction. You can uh, uh, attractively, I think that's where the big benefit of MR, MR is, you can very nicely see the uh, effect of any treatment if you want to go focal. So once you can identify the lesion, you can nicely monitor if the outcome of the treated area is favorable. But now if you look at the data again, and this is out for many years, again, the data are rather limited. All of us would be waiting for the clinical data. And you see that Mark Emberton has been the lead in one of the largest studies there. But unfortunately, at the moment, although the data should be mature, I think are not being shared with us. And obviously, maybe photodynamic therapy, although of interest, is maybe not ready available for clinical use yet. I intensely focus ultrasound. As I mentioned, three decades later, you can see 1994, the first use in prostate um, in, in, in men, of course. If you look at the uh, different characteristics, again, high-intensity focus ultrasound uh, can be used uh, in, in specific organs by reaching a higher temperature in an organ and with a specific focus, you can obviously destruct tissue. You have several routes to deliver this. Transrectal is the best known one. And in the early days, to prove that high-intensity focus ultrasound was doing a good job is to do an ablate and resect study. So we did a study in 20 patients where we did a high-intensity focus ultrasound, and three to four weeks later, we did a radical prostatectomy. This was in the early days. You could confirm that indeed within the treated area, all tissue was destroyed. The problem is it was sometimes difficult to properly target and also predict the extent of the lesion. Uh, here we tried with contrast, uh, uh, with, uh, with power Doppler, if we could see that no vascularity was seen in the early studies, and we tried to use this as a monitoring tool. So which patients, again, have been studied in this for focal treatment? I know that Monsori is doing some cases here as well. You can see on the published data, again, we're moving to radiation failures. You see small numbers. The problem is once you do radiation and offer an ablative treatment, you may consider the fact that the side effects may be serious, including urine leak and erectile dysfunction. So radiation failures are maybe interested in having a selfish treatment, but they have to balance the fact that the side effects might be significant. There's also a route via the transurethral applicator uh, studies are being done right now while patients are in an MR. It's very time-consuming. First studies are being done in Heidelberg and in Toronto, as far as I know. And you can see here some of the thermal maps where the applicator is placed transurethrally, and you can watch real-time the temperatures generated within the prostate. Again, if this is a procedure that will be adopted by many, has a big question mark. If you look at the uh, data that are coming on this, again, are on small number of patients. Looking at focal treatment for um, uh, pre uh, patients using uh, irreversible electroporation, again, it's out recently, 2004, the first medical use. If you look at this, again, via the transperineal route, electrodes are introduced and current is generated between the electrodes. Um, there may also be some thermal effect. 
and the combination results in a very nicely demarcated area where tissue is um, um, treated. The inclusion criteria for the studies thus far are rather strict, so it's being studied whether it's safe, it's being studied whether it's uh, effective, and especially if you look at the uh, side effects that's at the present being studied. Again, the approach is like for those who are familiar with brachytherapy, depending on the needle configuration, you have a certain area treated. Um, the procedure as such is rather fast, um, but it doesn't mean that everything that's fast is good. So we looked at several trials, and I will show some of the data later. Uh, selected centers are involved. Um, complications at the moment are relatively low grade and self-limiting. Uh, the functional outcomes are favorable thus far. And of course, for the oncological outcome, you need to have a larger group and more data than this. What is always attractive that I share with you the most beautiful images that you have to show that it works. So this is a patient that had a treatment in the, in the left side uh, four weeks before had IRE. You can see a very nice area once the prostate is harvested. You see very nice and sharply demarcated area where there are no skip lesions within the treated area. You can see on the left lower part the ultrasound image with contrast where there's a complete non-vascularized area which is also matching very nicely with MRI. Once again, impressive, but is this enough to convince myself that I should offer this to all my patients? I will, I will be critically reviewing those data. And then last but not least, we as urologists think that we, have, we are the master of all this, but keep in mind that the radio-oncologist is following very closely what we are doing, and also he is coming with focal approaches. And maybe they are going to take the lead with the sheer number of patients that they treat. They may, may be even stronger take the lead than we are doing at the moment. You can see that especially for brachytherapy since 1917, it has been pushed in their hands. And we as urologists, we are not always actively involved in this. Radiation therapy obviously has some strong arguments. And if you look at this, you can either use uh, IMRT for this or brachytherapy. And it seems that brachytherapy here is going to be a very attractive player in offering focal treatment for prostate cancers. Um, there are some, some pros and cons on all this. Um, I, I would say visit one of your radioncologists and discuss with him what are his programs that he is developing. Uh, the reports coming on the different technologies are very limited. I know that, for example, in Japan, they're working strongly on this based on the fact that no other technology is allowed to be used for focal treatment. Brachytherapy there seems to be the winner, and with already whole brachy of prostates in place, a focal treatment becomes attractive. I discussed with my radioncologist why focal because brachy of prostate is safe, effective, and has low morbidity. Of course, this is not always true, because the morbidity after brachy can also be significant. So they want to reduce that. If you look at the series which are coming on, on implantation, they are larger than ours. This one from 2012, over 300 patients. If you look at this, I think uh, with... with uh, uh, from Paris Barret, again, over 100 patients. I think we should carefully watch how they will push it into the guidelines, Carlos, and they will get it, and we are still looking if we should use MRI guided, yes or no. So that's the threat. The threat is that we are maybe not organized well enough, and we think that we are fantastic, but others will overpower us, and I'm convinced that focal brachy will be in the guidelines while we are still searching for if one or the other is better. And maybe we want to be stronger involved with the radioncologists on that. Now look at the different trials on the way. And I mean, they really do good research that is funded. Late toxicity, quality of life, early toxicity, 
target definition, and again, toxicity. They are doing exactly what we should do, collaborate in different projects and support each other. And that's what I also learned a little bit, that we are small islands presenting some data and think that this is the ultimate proof. We should be able to collaborate more and act faster. So what does it say about Brakey? Well, trials underway, only level D of evidence, which means expert opinion. But again, I'm confident that they, in their collaboration, will be very successful in positioning this. Now, there are other sources. When you are approached, they offer you radio frequency, water vapor, microwave, again, histotripsy. I think before you actually even consider to talk about it, the companies should, together with the urologist, the community, take the responsibility to study it properly. In summary, the last two slides. We should define appropriate outcomes. We should have a careful look at our methodology. If we study one device, we shouldn't take different criteria from studying another device. We should be able to compare them. What about oncological outcomes and quality of life? Well, I will present a study that we are conducting where the focus will be on quality of life. If I have to wait for the oncological outcomes, it will take 10 to 15 or 20 years. That's where you will lose because for 20 years you will not be able to make a decision. Which patients do we select? That's still difficult. So in all the studies we include MRI, biopsies, whatsoever, but still it's very difficult to come on that. Standardization of terminology. Everybody talks about a significant tumor, but nobody knows what a significant tumor is until the patient either dies after 20 years in good conditions or because of cancer then you know if it was a clinically significant tumor. We need to have prospective data and not just looking back. And then we need to balance, and I think that's where the patients come in. They not only want to be cured, but they want to have a good quality of life. And I remember one of my patients that was on the list for surgery elsewhere, and when I was arriving in Amsterdam at the airport, he called me in the evening. He said, hello, Jean, I am on the list to have surgery tomorrow, but I rather cancel it. And now we are six years later, and he still asks me, was that a good decision? I think it was. And was I giving him good advice? I don't know, because he still needs to live another 15 to 20 years as a young man. This is a slide where I again looked at my friends from Montserrat. It's coming from Eric Barret. He says we should be able to give an a la carte approach in this personalized medicine. So a la carte, which means treat the tumor that needs a certain treatment, and we are still far away from that. So I'm sure you are not making up your mind yet which treatment you should include, but obviously all of us have in mind that this is the next step we should do. For this, we need more data, and I would caution everybody either to join in and collecting the data or wait until the data are mature. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Jans. I think and there was an excellent overview of the current available treatment that we have. I think, uh, Dr. Joint, have a question for you. I just would like to respond uh, briefly to uh, uh, Jans' uh, comment on the content of the guidelines regarding uh, focal therapy and some other uh, um, treatments. I think that we all know today that the content of the guidelines is based on evidence and we have to admit that there's no evidence, no, no evidence behind doing radical nephrectomy for a renal cell carcinoma. We don't need that. Uh, and the reason why uh, active surveillance is in the guidelines and focal therapy is not, uh, I think you gave uh, a very good explanation for that. I think there's an overwhelming uh, awareness today in, in, in our uh, in, in urology uh, that uh, overtreatment, and Anders Bartel uh, uh, explained that uh, uh, nicely yesterday, that uh, we are overtreating patients. Uh, so we, have to, we, we had to stop treating those patients that we uh, know uh, without any doubt that, we, that they don't need treatment. 
And that's the reason why active surveillance is in the guidelines. And the reason why focal therapy is not in the guidelines, you just gave those reasons. Short series, immature, uh, short term follow up, uh, lack of uh, long term results. And does this mean that I'm against uh, focal therapy? I'm not. And I, I can accept, uh, and I think that you should, in your uh, ACM in, in, in Amsterdam, do a focal therapy uh, or in uh, London, uh, very much like we uh, do uh, immunotherapy for advanced uh, prostate cancer, but within clinical trials. So I think it's very uh, important that uh, this experimental, and the term experimental is not negative. Uh, it's most likely, and I think, that in the near future, focal therapy will become a standard therapy as long as we develop a, a more uh, refined technique. But I think it's very important that this uh, type of uh, approach remains within dedicated centers like yours or some others uh, until we have uh, uh, long-term data. So, uh, and, and at that time, that will go up and uh, to the content of the guidelines for sure. I, I may It was brought in at the end by the radio colleges. So what I want to say is they are very well organized. We are less organized. So it would be an invitation that we should organize ourselves better and not wait for 10 or 20 years until we have an answer, but come on a shorter term. Look at active surveillance. We have hundreds of thousands of patients. We got 10,000 of millions of biopsies, but we're only looking at two papers. And we're always referring to the same papers. We can be much faster if we co collectively work on that and prospective include our data. But unfortunately, most of us are too busy, have no money, and uh, need a weekend. I, I don't know. It's not a criticism, but it's an observation. And I think we still have something to gain there. And that's nice. And I agree with you that you need to have some centers that do the pioneering work and do some research. And until then, all the others maybe should slow down. I fully agree with you. Yo, yo quería añadir un comentario, no sé si es en español o en inglés, pero uh, yo creo que, que tienes toda la razón, Carlos, pero yo creo que hay una razón detrás de eso eh, fundamental, que es que hasta el año pasado la FDA no había aprobado estos tratamientos. O sea, yo creo que, el, que la aprobación en octubre de 2015 de, por la FDA de todas estas, eh, bueno, ellos lo han llamado, eh, ellos se ha aprobado por esta vía de Novo Pathway y lo han llamado... Um, image guide, ablation tissue, ablation, something like that, va a cambiar la, la, el panorama en los próximos tres o cuatro años. Porque seamos, eh, bueno, seamos eh, sinceros, la mayor parte, evidentemente en Europa se hacen las cosas muy bien, pero en fin, es que es muy difícil competir contra un montón de instituciones académicas, 309 habitantes, es decir, la mayor evidencia y más rápida que se genera, como ha pasado con cantidad de tecnologías, se va a generar desde allí. Entonces, o sea, yo creo que no están las guías clínicas, evidentemente, porque falta experiencia, pero lo vamos a tener en los próximos años, porque hay un montón de instituciones que se van a implicar en esto de una manera clarísima. Agree. Any more questions? Thank you, doctor de la Rosette. Thank you.